Good morning. So I'm here with you today for one reason. I'm here to try and create what I would call a defining moment. A moment that in the 20 minutes or so that we have, this might just possibly change your life. Why else would I be here? But I imagine that you might be here for exactly the same reason. You've come here to this Wide for Wonder event and maybe to my talk this morning because you're looking for something too. You're looking for an insight, you're looking for a strategy, maybe something that sort of awakens another level of talent, another passion deep inside you that helps you be more effective, more successful, more significant than where you might already be. So what if I actually had that answer? What if what you're looking for is exactly what I'm about to share? I'm one of those people that believes that that type of thing is possible. Most defining moments happen in our lives quite accidentally. Somebody says something the right way at the right time that just, you know, gels with us and it jolts us to, to make a change in career, relationship, um, our eating habits, our health, our style. But instead of it happening accidentally, what if it was actually possible to line that up so that the way that you're wired and the way that I talk to you aligns in a way that hits those buttons, almost like acupuncture points that cause you to, to have change. Like a personal success code that, you know, you have a way of operating and I have a way of communicating and together it lines up. Rather than leaving success to chance or to a guesswork of just trying to figure out where should I go in life, how should I communicate, who, I, who should I be in a relationship with. So I imagine that it's possible, and I've spent the last 30 years of my life developing material that indeed has made that possible. And I want to share some of that with you today. And I want to take you back to where it started for me, or the main essence of it started when I was just 19 years of age. And I went on a weekend retreat. Personal development wasn't really big back then. This is in the um, late 70s. And, you know, I went on this retreat, I think mostly because a bunch of my friends were going, it was probably a gender imbalance or something and, you know, it looked uh, appealing for me to go. And um, I went on this retreat and it wasn't really a religious retreat. It was put on by our, by our church, but it wasn't really a religious retreat. But there were sprinklings of, you know, biblical stories woven into the, to the program. And there was this one particular story about halfway through the program that just hit me and changed my life. And I don't often share this story, but my team suggested I share it with you today. And when I was sitting there, this biblical story, it was known as the parable of the talents. And, and it very quickly went like this. This wealthy master was going away uh, for some time and he asked some of his servants to come and look after his wealth. So to one, to one servant he gave three talents, to another servant he gave two talents and to the last one he gave one talent. And so off he went, he came back a couple of years later and called them back in to say, well, how did you go? Where's my money? And... Uh, Talents back then was, was coin, you know, and, and so the first person came in, he said, well, Master, you know, you gave me three talents, it's been challenging, you know, global financial crisis, oil price, you know, it hasn't been easy, but I've done all right, I've got three more talents, so here's the six talents. He said, actually, that's really good, well done, here's more, go and keep investing. In came the second person, what have you done with my money? Well, you gave me two talents, I've gone and done some investment with it, I've got two more, here's the... The money and he said look that's a great job well done here's more go and keep investing and then he called in the third person to whom he'd given one talent and he said to this third person what have you done with my money he said well sir I heard that you were a hard man I heard that you know you'd be really strict uh, on what I would do so I was concerned that given I only had one talent I didn't want to waste it or lose it so I just held on to it hid it under my bed you know I did nothing with it um, but I've at least got it so here it is the one talent. And sure enough, the, the master said, you wasteful, wicked man. And he took the talent and banished him um, from his, you know, from his uh, world. And in that moment, that was me. You know, the message that I got, which now look back, I was very hard on myself for 19 years of age. But the message that I got was, if my life was called to account that day, I felt I had nothing to show for it. And yet, for me, I'd been given a wonderful family, very loving, you know, supportive family, a wonderful education. I had a very holistic education and upbringing. 
surrounded by great friends and extended family, had a wonderful career opportunity, and yet really I had nothing to show for it. And I made a decision in that moment that that'll never happen to me again. That I'm going to, whatever it takes, I'm going to find out what my talents are. Uh, I heard talent, you know, not, not wealth. I'm going to find out what my talents are and I'm going to do my darndest to use them to the fullest. But this was such a profound impact on me. I'm like, everyone's got to know this. I, I want to help other people do this too. But I didn't know there would be any way I could make money from it and, and live a life while I was doing that. So I thought, well, I'll just go and keep doing what I'm doing and I'll come back to that and do like a voluntary aspect of my life, maybe in my 40s, you know, when I'm, when I'm wealthier. Well, I'm past 40 and I'm still working. So, you know, but things did change for me and I'll keep going with my story. So I got back to doing my career and my career at the time was financial planning and in a particular field which we called succession planning, which was helping business owners transition their, their um, business from one ownership, generally one generation, mum and dad, through to their children or staff. And I thought, oh, well, I can at least use my talents, you know, in making a difference for these people. And what I found was I'd be sitting there talking through the complexities of their business. And then they'd say, well, what we want to do is transfer the business from, you know, my wife and myself over here to our children. But my son here, David, 30 years of age, Bachelor of Commerce from the University of New South Wales, he's, he's going to lead the business. And I don't know whether you've had this feeling, but you know when you meet somebody and you just think, there's, there's no way this person's going to do this. There was, but, you know, I was 25, 26... There was a part of me that's like, Paul, that's really judgmental. You've only known them for five minutes. They're the parents who've known this guy for 30 years. Surely they wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't the right thing. Logically, it's stacked up. He's had 10 years of experience in the business. He's done his commerce degree. Mum and dad must know what they're doing. They wouldn't put all that money at risk if it wasn't the right thing. You know, and so I think I'd try and dismiss what was, whatever it was inside him about intuition and so on at that age. I was just feeling something. And, and yet I was really concerned because I'd be thinking, if you transfer this business to that person and it goes south, not only do you lose the business, often it was you'd lose your retirement money as well, but it would fracture the family because there are other kids involved or family. Feel, think of the guilt that that person would feel to their parents. I'm like, who's, who's dealing with this human element? You know? And then just by the by, accidentally, their, their daughter or other son walks past and they go, oh, this is Steve or this is Mary, you know, sort of introduced them, but there was something about that person, I think, that's the person. If that person took it on, I reckon this could work. And I, I started having these conversations with their parents about, how come you chose David and you didn't choose Stephen or Mary? You know, and, and the reasons weren't really sensible reasons. They were just like, well, he's the oldest. You know, he's done the commerce degree. I did a commerce degree and, you know, I don't know that I learned a lot about in that degree necessarily, just on its own, to go and take on some of the, the responsibility that these guys were taking on. So I was really concerned about it. I'm like, I, I went on a mission to try and find how can we somehow figure out what I was observing with my own experience. I didn't know about Maya Briggs or DISC or personality testing. I just was seeing something. So I went off searching and I found, all about, you know, found out about psychometric testing and, and so on and I started to think, oh, okay, this, this might make some sense. So I kept exploring. Then there was another thing that was happening for me. I had become a dad. We just started our family, and at that time I had two children. I had a little four-year-old girl and a two-year-old boy. Who, who here has got at least two kids? Put your hand up if you've got at least two kids. Now, are your kids, are they the same or are they different? I don't mean gender. I mean in terms of how they tick. Would you say they're the same or are they different? Different. Are they like a little bit different? If they come from the same mould, are they a little bit different or are they like wildly different? How does that work? How does that work that here we are as adults and in the, in the later part of the 20th century when, when we, you know, in, in the world of human resources, it was all about if we want people to change their behaviour, we could train them, we could incentivise them, we can punish them, we can, you know, we can sort of engineer it so that people can either be whatever they want to be or do whatever they want to do with the right type of construct and conditioning around them. And yet for me, I'm watching these two beautiful, innocent children who didn't know to be different to each other and who were brought up the same. I mean, our daughter was just perfect to, well, to me. I'm the dad, you know. She was just beautiful and doing everything with manners and, you know, obedience and so on. And I'm like, well, our son will be the same. I mean, he's coming through the same mould. Well, obviously, someone heard 
my arrogance and gave us a son that was completely different. And I've now come to learn um, most of you have had the same sort of experience as me. And I'm like, what is that? What is that that's somehow ingrained into a kid as young as days, weeks, months, before and regardless of whether we as their parents can influence them? What is that? I saw it there, I saw it in David, the 30-year-old, and then I go and talk to people in their 70s and 80s. And I know this probably sounds like I was like fanatical about this, but I, I don't say I was fanatical, I, I use the word fascinated. I was fascinated. And I would encourage you to find, people talk about finding their passions, find what it is you're fascinated about, because that keeps you hungry, keeps you going. And I was fascinated about what makes people tick and why, why is it so? And when I talk to the 70 and 80 year olds about was it possible to change who you are and reinvent yourself and become what people wanted, they were like, well, you know, I, I thought it was. And you know what, for a period of time I did. I was in a job where in order to get that promotion or in order to keep a monkey off my back or maybe just to pay the mortgage and keep my job, I did reinvent myself. I became more of a people person. I became friendlier. I became more outgoing. I became more organised or more disciplined in what I was doing. Yeah, I did do it. But you know what? I got to a point in my life where I thought, this is sucking so much energy trying to be like this. It can't be this hard. Or it was, in their phrases, it was sucking the life out of me. I felt like I was working so against my natural grain. And I'm like, what is that? I'm seeing that in my kids. I'm hearing it in these wise adults at 70, 80 years of age that there's this natural grain, there's this river flowing within somebody. Could it be, you know, that it's true? I mean, for centuries people talked about nature and nurture, but in the 20th century all of our emphasis went into the nurture side of the debate and we stayed away from nature. And so I, I literally, and I've still got it today, I have the thesaurus I went through, flicking through, what is the word that would define there's something like a force. It's inside you from the beginning, like innate. And then it stays with you. And no matter how much you try and change it, even for years you can go against it, but eventually you have your midlife crisis or your sea change or something as an event to come back to your true self. You're doing what comes naturally. I mean, even, even Shakespeare talked about to thine, to thine own self be true. But, but what is it? What is it? How do you define it? Other than just total guesswork. And so at 26 years of age and not knowing that it wasn't possible, I kept going on my journey to explore the value of instinct. And I went to Harvard University and I met with a professor over there in neuropsychiatry and he said to me, Paul, stay away from instinct. It's so old. It's so done. We are humans. We have intellect. We have, because of our intellect, we have the faculty of choice. And that gives us the ability to override our instincts. And I'm like, yep, I get it. I, I get the logic of it. It all makes sense to me too. But that's not what my experience is. That's not what I'm seeing. And my fascination wasn't to just comply with the schools of thought in the academic world or with, with you know, whatever psychometric testing was out there. Because when I explored that, people would say, yeah, it's interesting, but it still doesn't help me understand why I'm like that. And so... I kept going with the search. And even though they said, stay away from instinct, it's what I was seeing, this thing that's like a river that's deeply running inside you. I could see it in myself, you know. I could see, one time I came back from holidays and my secretary had cleaned up my, my office and it was really tidy. And I remember thinking, whoa, that's really cool. I'm going to keep it like that. And I went in, sat down, started work and the phone rang. The next thing I had files out and like five minutes later, I had stuff everywhere. And I'm like, how did that just happen? Like, I totally, I totally just committed myself to not do that. And it wasn't five minutes. And then I'd say, well, look, I'll send it to you the minute I finish the call. And I'd finish the call. I'd move on with something else. And I'd get a phone call an hour later. Are you going to send that thing through? I'm like, oh, how did I forget that? I, like, I totally meant to do that. Is that just forgetfulness? Or is there something else that's pulling me in a different direction? My fascination continued. So the long and the short of it was, through a lot of research and a lot of conversations with people and finding patterns to the responses I was getting back, I actually found that there are indeed striving instincts in every person. 
there is a truth to the nature versus nature uh, versus nurture debate. There are four instincts, and in fact, I know a number of you have gone online and done the idea. I think Sarah Rucroft, in her brilliance, provided the opportunity for all of you to be able to do your ID as part of coming to this event. And if you haven't done it yet, I'd really encourage you to jump online and do it and find out what your own personal success code is, your ID. But you know, now there's not only the, the, the framework of assessing and, and saying, well, there are four drives and here's a way to map them. I did all that back in 1990 and 1991 and then put the ID on the market and have spent the last 25 years or thereabouts building out strategies. Because what's so important to me was the... I, I wasn't into this for the psychology of it. I was truly wanting to help people and help them use their talents. And what people would say is, you know, well, I'm, I've got an ID like this that's entrepreneurial, but I'm sort of stuck in a role that, that is containing me. Do I need to change roles? Or, or is there a way I can do this within my current frame? Or I'm in a relationship where I feel constrained. Do I need to like change the relationship? Or is there a way we can re-engineer it so that I can be more in stride? And whilst, whilst it would make sense, you could say, you know what, you need to change the relationship or you need to change the job. What do you do when a parent says to you, I've got four kids and I'm battling with one of them. Are we meant to have that child in our family? Are they maybe, should they resign or should I resign? I mean, <laughs> you can't do that. And I'm like, well, you know what? What's good for the goose is good for the gander. If there's a way that a parent can change their perspective or their approach that can now have a better relationship with their child, why can't they do that with their spouse? Why can't they do that with their, um, with their career? And I'm not saying you can in every case, but I've had so many people say to me over the years, Paul, if we'd have known about this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it could have saved a marriage. I wouldn't have the fractured relationship with my child. My career would have been so much more successful. Because it's all about, you know, instead of spending time guessing your way through life, trying to figure out your ID, what if you actually could just know what it is and go straight down that path? That's power. That's really powerful. And that's, that's been my journey of where I've gotten to and what we've built out. And so that brings me to today. And the vision that I have for ID, which is that everyone in the world knows and uses their ID. And I have a team of people here and in the States and that's, that's our journey, and it's online, and it's live with consulting and coaching work and so on. Because what I've found is that not only is your ID the way to be at your best, what I've found, is, people say, well, do I need to be like that all the time? I'm like, well, you have a choice. You know, this is where your cognition does come in. You have a choice whether you discover what it is, whether you decide to be like that. But I'm not sure that everyone wants to be, you know, less than their best. I think you're here because you want to discover a way to be at your best. In fact, let's just check where you are today. I want to do an exercise with you that plays to that defining moment experience that I mentioned to you right at the beginning. I want to think about your current performance and your fulfillment in life and just where you're at on your journey. If we were to talk about a scale of 0 to 10, and a 10 out of 10 is you in stride. In fact, you probably don't need to tell the people around you that you're a 10 out of 10. It's probably obvious, a bit like a bride on her wedding day. You just radiate this energy. A 10 out of 10 is like when you hear people say, I'm in stride, I'm in the flow, I'm in the zone, as the athletes would say. Things come easy, I make great decisions. Although I'm working really hard, I don't seem to get tired. It's just electric for me, you know, I love it. And a one is definitely snooze button time. You know, it's like, oh man, I don't want to go there. It might be a snooze button or it might be almost like a snooze button at the other end of the day where you don't want to go home because you know what's waiting for you if you go home. It's like you can just feel the life is going to get sucked out of me. I don't want this. A one is where you feel repulsed by a situation. I don't want to go to work. I don't want that relationship. I'm, I'm, I'm out of there. If you may be a five out of ten, you know, it's okay. I'm doing it. It's a job. I think my boss is happy. I make my money. I go home. Or it's a relationship. I mean, we've been married for 10 years. I mean, we're there. We love each other. Convince me, you know. So on that scale of 0 to 10, what's your number? What's the number that's already inside you? There's no more a scientific calculation than that. Your instincts are already screaming a number at you in some cases, but there's a number that your mind is saying to you. And it might be saying you're a four, 
And then your cognitive mind is saying, oh, four, I'm not a four. You know, I'm better than a four. And it's saying, no, four. <laughs> four. Four. Right? Now, I want you to do something here for your benefit, but I want you to do this really honestly for the benefit of everyone here as well so you can share this with each other. You'll help create something pretty profound here. I want you to share your number. Not with each other, just with a show of hands. But I want you to be really honest with it. Put your hand up if you were a 10 out of 10. Put your hand up if you're a 10. Put your hand up if you're a 9. Okay, we have a few 9s, that's good. Congratulations, that's great. What about an 8? A few more 8s? 7? Okay, I'm not going to go all the way down the scale and embarrass anybody who might be having a hard time so you can relax now. But put your hand up if you were 6 or below. Just put your hand up. It's, it's probably a little over half the room. So we run that, um, question, we run that question across our um, interaction on the application that some of you have seen, and the average score around the world that comes back is 6.2. 6.2 out of 10. Now, it's interesting, you know, as Australians especially, the reaction when we do this in workshops with clients, you can see the reaction, right? They sort of go, 6.2? 6.2 is pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> 6.2, that's like, that's close enough to seven. That's, 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 that's a credit, you know. That's a pretty good result. Let me tell you, if you're trying to lead a team or a business from 6.2, you ain't happening. And so you have a choice. Whether or not you decide to keep living at 6.2 or whether you can find a way, and this is the key to your ID, find a way to step it up and get yourself up to a first a seven, then an eight, then a nine, then a 10. I've had some people say to me in life, it's not possible to be a 10 out of 10. Well, of course it's not gonna be possible if that's what you believe. But sadly for them, we're working with people all around the world who have gotten to a 10 out of 10. And their productivity doesn't just improve by five or 10%, it improves by like double and triple in a team. And the code is there for you today to discover what that is for you. You know, I'm out of time, so I'm gonna finish with this. We weren't born or destined to be six or seven out of 10. We weren't destined to live in a darkness or the shadow of somebody else's lives and expectations. You have a way that's your way. You have a way that's being wired into you that's the secret code for you, the secret source for you to shine and be at your best. It's called your ID, your personal success code. You're here investing in how to be the best you can be. No matter what ideas you learn, and there'll be many great ideas, how you put them into place needs to be in a way that's natural and fitting for you. You don't have to spend any more time guessing what it is. There's a way for you that's being made available to you to just find out what it is and take that forward. When you do that, you stop wasting time guessing how to perform, wondering whether you're with the right person, wondering whether you'll have to sustain you know, ongoing negativity and tiredness and lethargy and even ill health. It shows you with strategies how to get on track with who you are and be at your best. It's actually possible. So yes, you have an ID. Yes, you have natural talents. Yes, you have fascination and a passion that can bring the best out in you. Yes, it's possible to live in relationships that exhilarate you and have careers that exhilarate you. It is possible, but only if you do it in a way that aligns to your true self. The sooner you get there, not only do you have a level of success that's gonna work for you, but you're gonna really give other people around you the gift of you fully alive. And that's the way we were born to be. Thank you.